very happy to be back here today. I will go ahead and just apologize now if I look exhausted. <laughs> it's because I am. So <laughs> I have no excuses. I just, I am. I'm tired. No, we, for those of you who don't know, we have a newborn, and uh, she is three weeks old today and is the most beautiful, most amazing thing on the face of this earth, as well as my other two kids and my wife. <laughs> She's awesome, man. I'm telling you, she's so cute. And I don't, she's been the easiest one so far of the three. <laughs> but I'm just so, man, I'm, uh, we're over the moon with this one. And uh, as we are with our other two, we love our other two children so very much. Uh, it's crazy. You know, you think like well, you have your first child and, you're, and you have this, this capacity for love just seems to like almost explode with your first kid. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I could, I could love something this much. And then you get pregnant and you're like, I'm going to have another kid. How am I going to love another thing as much as I love this one? And then it's like this, this grace that just covers you and your love capacity just explodes again. And you're like, wow, I really can love two children the same. And then a third one happens. It's like, it's like God created us in this way to continue to expand our capacity in ways that we never thought we could even, it, it was even possible. Because he's so good. He makes a way, right? He always makes a way. And, and when you are willing, when you're open and receptive, man, there's some really incredible things that he will do in your life if you allow him to. Really incredible things. And so I'm just, man, I'm just so thankful this morning. Um, I'm thankful to be here this morning. Uh, it's, I really appreciate being able to watch online. My wife is at home uh, with Cece. Her name is Cecilia Joel, if you don't know. Uh, Cecilia Joel, we call her Cece. And she's at home right now, growing and sleeping and probably pooping and all the, all the things that babies do, I think. I don't know. I haven't, we haven't really slept much, so there's that. Uh, they sleep during the day, right? At night is when they, they're, they're nocturnal animals. That's what I hear. No, I'm prophesying she's going to sleep through the night. Come on now. Because this is 2021, we got to run. We're not done. <laughs> it's hard to run when you're tired, isn't it? It's hard to run when you're tired. But you know what? Sometimes we just press through and, and, and rely on the supernatural rest and grace of our Father because He does it. I, I'm telling you, five minutes in His presence, just away from everything else, we are carriers of the presence of God. Please don't get me wrong. But, but five minutes away from everything for a moment with Him it, it, it is like a thousand hours of sleep in my bed. You know, it's just, it's so refreshing and it's so restorative uh, that you can't describe it. And you talk to somebody who's like, what are you talking about? And it's like, I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, 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 gotta, you gotta try this. You gotta try this. Separate yourself from everything for a moment. Get with him. Just, just some intimate time, one-on-one, -on -one, and, and watch how your cup gets filled right back up. Watch how it just gets filled right back up to where it's overflowing. It's not empty. So we can go pour it out to those beautiful ones that he gives to us. Amen? I'm just thankful this morning. I'm very, very thankful this morning. And I'm also thankful. <laughs> I'm thankful for this church, like, so much. I'm watching online. I texted Miriam and some others several times. I'm just so, I'm just so stinking proud to be a part of this church, man. I'm, I'm so, just watching you guys and, and, and worship, and, and the words have been incredible. You did a great job last week. Just a great job. Uh, Tony, you did an incredible job. I mean, like, it, it's been so good just to be able to sit back, and I thought, man, I'm so thankful for what we have. Not everybody has that, that the pastor can go take five weeks away, and the church doesn't go crazy. This church is amazing. And I'm thankful for the foundations that have been laid before us. I'm thankful for what we're doing here. And I'm thankful for you guys and what God is doing in your life and how there is growth and there are healthy, positive things that are coming out of this place, out of this house, this house of miracles. I love that. And I'm thankful for that because not everybody can say that. And so thank you. Thank you for being you. Thankful, thank you for being obedient. Thank you for, for sharing, for, for not being afraid, for stepping up, for opening up, for worshiping, for allowing the gifts of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit to, to, to function and manifest here in this house. I'm so proud and I'm so thankful to be able to be a part of this. I'm also thankful, you know, um, in this kind of a season when you have a baby and you go through COVID, that's a whole experience in and of itself. Not just COVID, but COVID with a baby. Like, as you're pregnant, that was, for, for, if you don't know, Marla was actually going to get the vaccine on a Sunday, and she tested positive for COVID that 
day. And uh, so then we ended up doing, you know, having COVID in our house for a couple weeks. And then uh, when we were supposed to get induced, and then that got pushed back because of COVID. And so then finally, she ended up going into labor on her own. And we, we get to the hospital, and we do that whole thing. And of course, we're COVID positive, so we can't touch them with a 10-foot pole. And so we get in our room and we're isolated from everyone and everything. And the nurses are in there and they got to wear their full garb. So you feel really guilty if you have to call them in because they got to take 10 minutes just to, you know, get all dressed up. And I'm just, I'm so thankful for them uh, very much. They did an incredible job. Um, But man, it was definitely a different kind of experience. No visitors, obviously. That's weird whenever you have a baby, no visitors. And uh, oh, and probably my, our least favorite part was that Cece couldn't leave the room. And so... Tip to any new parents, when the nurses offer you to take your child into the nursery, just say yes. Say yes, especially when you've been up for the past 36 hours straight. Say yes. Let them take them into the nursery and and you get just a moment of sleep because we didn't get that. And I'm telling you, it was it was so fun. It was so fun. But man, so leaving the hospital, we've gotten so many... um, calls and texts and, and messages and, and everything. And I'm so thankful for that. It's really, it's really overwhelming uh, to see the kind of love and support that you have from your community around you. And I'm not going to cry. It's very overwhelming um, how much love and support you guys have for our family. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. Um, I know my wife is, and if she were here, she'd cry a lot more than me because she's very emotional right now. Um, but just the food and, and the calls and the prayers and all of it, we are so humbled and thankful that you guys love us so much and would care to, to, to reach out to our family. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. It's incredible to be able to be a part of a community of people who love and care for one another. And I'm looking at this and I'm just thinking, man, like this is what the body of Christ is supposed to be. When, when someone goes through something, everyone rushes in to help them out. They, 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 how can I help you? How can I? I let, let me do something for you. Like, let me help and let me serve. So, so I, I want to say today, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for watching our children, uh, our other two children. That's been incredible. Uh, thank you so much. You guys are amazing. And My wife, my family, I speak on behalf of all of us. We are so incredibly thankful for you. And today I want to talk about that a little bit. I don't have a lot of notes um, here. I've been praying a lot, and I've talked with Pastor Miriam about this. I feel like this season of life, not just not for me, not just for me personally, but just for the church, is is a season of almost getting back to some basic, simplistic kind of mentality and attitude. Uh, and, and because, and let me explain what I mean here. I, I feel like there's been a time where we can get bloated on um, sermons, get, get bloated on teaching, yep. where it's like, it's like almost like eating a Thanksgiving meal at every meal. If you, you gain a lot of weight when you do that, typically. You feel very awkward uh, until you take a moment to maybe fast, to, to, to slow down on your eating, to exercise, to move, and to do get out to go and to be. And so I know we've been talking about, and, and, and well, it's been several weeks now, but the Salt Assault series was designed for more of an engagement of, of, of the body of Christ, an engagement of, hey, let's get out. Let's go be the body. Let's, 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 let's stop consuming all the salt and let's go be the salt, right? Let's not get fat and sassy, but let's go and, and, and be the light, arise and shine. And so I've been praying about that a lot. And, I, and I've told Pastor Miriam about this too. We've had a lot of discussion about, you know, I want this next season for us to not be, not be as focused on teaching as is applying teaching. I heard one time and I thought it was really good. I believe it was Apostle Dan Dyer. He said, you know, there are so many who crave the meat of the word. You know, talking about the milk versus the meat of the word. And he said, the meat of the word is just taking the milk and applying it. And there's so many of us that are like, man, I just need some more meat. I'm not getting anything out of this service. I'm not getting anything out of this sermon. It's just milk. It's like, well, have you applied any of that milk? Have you applied said milk to your life? If you have, then that's one thing. If you haven't, that's a whole nother ballgame, you know? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, Lord, help us in this season to not be so, it's, it, man, it's awesome to crave good teaching. 
It's awesome to crave good teaching. The, the problem is when we just crave teaching for the knowledge so that I can know and have this revelation, but I never apply revelation. You know, revelation without application is just information. I'm just filling my head with knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, and it makes me proud, and I'm this proud Christian who knows all my stuff, but I don't do anything. And I'm not representing Father. I'm not representing the heart of Jesus. I'm not being the hands and feet. I'm just a smart guy. Or as we like to say, a wise guy. The three wise guys. <laughs> so I think this is a season for us to get back to the basics, back to simplicity, a return to our first love kind of a season. You know, I'm, and I'm reminded of the dream that I had and with, with Trent being in it, and I'm laying hands on this young man, and, and I'm praying for him to receive salvation. And in this moment, Trent is there, and he is experiencing, experiencing this with his back turned, but he turns around and he says, I remember what this feels like. That kind of a season, going back to my first love, back to the, the passionate honeymoon phase of my relationship with God, where I'm, I'm intimately close. It's like nothing can come in between us. I'm so fiery and passionate about who you are and who I am in you and, and the excitement of discovering new things in you every day and being thankful for the life that you saved me from. What can I do now? What, how can I live now? Not just on Sunday. Every day. Man, if I only sleep with my wife on Sundays, it's hard to have an intimate relationship. If I only hang out with my family one time a month, it's hard to have a close relationship. But I'm at the coffee shop every moment. I'm at my job every day. I've got really good relationships there prioritize. You know, I had a conversation with a minister this, uh, this week who, who, who said, Caleb, I'm going to have to cancel coming to, to, to minister because I've got to take care of some stuff with my family. And I'm like, man, I, I almost wish I could hear that more from ministers because he's saying I'm prioritizing my life with my family over going out and, and ministering somewhere else. I so respect and appreciate that because God established the family before he established the ecclesia. And sometimes as, as ministers, it's easy to neglect the family to, to take care of the other family. And it's like, whoa, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I never want my children to grow up resentful of church. I was so happy to walk in this morning and, and Kitely and Daniel, as soon as they walk in, they're like, ah, church, and they start running around, having a good time. I want that for my family. I want them to want to be here. I want them to want God. I want them to want relationship. So it's, it's coming back to this place. I'm getting way too far. I'm not even planning on talking about this. Um, I'm sorry. First day back. But a rekindled flame. I only have a few notes this morning, uh, but I believe this is a life-changing message. It's only, it's only a few things, but if you take it and you, and you put it in your life, your life's going to change. I, pr- I, I literally promise you that. I promise your life will change. Today I want to talk about service. I want to talk about how do we respond? How do we get back to this place of first love? What does that look like? And, and I'm going to visit a, a very familiar passage in Romans chapter 12. You can turn there with me this morning. I'm going to read this. Um, I love the way the Passion Translation puts this. I typically read out of the English Standard Version, but I want to read for you this morning out of the Passion just because I like the way this reads. It says, Beloved friends, what should our proper response to God's, what should it be to God's marvelous mercies? What should our response be? We had a sister last week who talked about response, didn't she? I love that message. Like, I love that whole sermon of what is your response? Because see, each one of us has been presented this opportunity and this gift. How do you respond to it? How do you respond to it? Some people take the gift and like, oh, thanks for the gift. And they go throw it in the back of their car. Some people respond to the gift and they open it up immediately. And they're like, oh, this is pretty cool. Some people open up the gift and like, oh, that was lame. They're not grateful. They're not thankful. How do you respond? How do you respond to the gift that's been given to you? Or the gifts that have been given to you? But specifically the gift of Christ, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, the gift of life abundantly here on this earth. How do you respond to that? Literally this morning I was having a conversation with Kitely and Daniel. And Kitely, (laughs) she's so cute. My my kids are pretty confident. Um, She walks up to Daniel and she says, I'm prettier than you. (laughs) And I look at Marley, and we both go, well, we've got to address that. 
And we told her, we said, Kylie, you know, you can't, she's not here to defend herself, so we can talk about this. And she's five. Uh, she said, uh, we said, you can't talk, to, we don't talk to people like that. You can talk to people, we don't. We don't talk to people like that because love doesn't talk to people like that. Even if it may be true. It could be truth, but if it's not spoken in love, don't speak it. Don't speak it. Okay? We don't talk to people like that because it's going to make them feel bad on top of everything else. And she's like, but, but he started it. I said, no, he didn't. You walked up to him and said, I'm prettier than you. He didn't start anything. I said, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. And it doesn't matter if he did start it. He does not control your response. But see that, like, and I'm thinking, oh gosh, there's a, there's a lesson for the we adults here. It doesn't matter who started it. What matters is your response. How do you respond? How do you respond to grace and mercy? Do you go on sinning by heavens? No. I think that's what Paul says. I don't know if he said by heavens, but he said no. Goodness gracious, no. Just because grace has been made available to you, just because it's free and a good and perfect, wonderful gift does not mean you take and you spit in the face of it. How do you respond? How do you respond? I love that message. I could, I, we could go on that for days. Okay, so beloved friends, what should our proper response to God's marvelous mercies be? To surrender yourselves to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices, and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. You know, I love that because it touches on a few different areas. And, and most of us, when we think about worship, we think about what we just did. We, you know, we sang songs, we lifted our hands, we praised, we blessed God's name, we prophesied, we, we encouraged, we exhorted, we did all these kinds of things. But Paul is saying, this is your beautiful, perfect expression of worship by living your life as a sacrifice unto the Lord. What does that even mean? We don't I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't see any bulls or goats in here for sacrifices. Um, although, now that I think about it, there probably are some bullheaded people in here. And probably some goats who eat just about anything they want. Maybe we need to lay those things on the altar. Sacrifice those things. That's a whole other sermon. I'm not talking about sacrifices today in the sense of blood sacrifices because there were already was one perfect blood sacrifice. That was Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came. He lived. He demonstrated the love of God, of Father, of His heart. And He died and He rose again. He was a perfect sacrifice. And in His sacrifice, God establishes a new covenant with mankind through Jesus Christ that all we've got to do is say, I believe in Jesus. You are God. I put my faith in you. It's easy to think about faith as like this, this object or something and, and, and instead of, I, I believe in him. I believe Jesus is God. Like, I don't need to make it any harder than it is. I believe that Jesus is God. There's no question to me about that. Don't, don't question me about my faith. I believe Jesus is God, you know? Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So I'm not talking today about us going and, you know, butchering goats and, and bulls and doves and those kinds of things. What, what Paul is talking about is living your life in a manner that is sacrificial, in worship to our God. Living your life in a way that you lay down your life for Him. See, there's this thing when we, when, we, when we say Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus is King, He's King of kings, He's Lord of lords, He is God. Yet then we tend to pick up our own lives off the altar and, and we become Lord or, or we become God. And we put ourselves in our own service now. I serve myself. It's much more comfortable and it's way easier for me to serve myself. But a, 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 a Christian life, a, a Christ-centered life, a Christ-following life does not look like that. It is a life that lays itself down. It's a life that says, no, I have my preferences. I know what feels good to me. I know I can be bullheaded. I know I can be smart. I know I can eat whatever I want and, 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 and do what feels good to me in my flesh. A life of Christ says, no, I'm not doing those things. I'm laying that stuff at the altar. I'm laying the bull and I'm laying the goat at the altar. <laughs> I'm laying myself at the altar and I'm submitting my life to you. I'm submitting myself to you in relationship, tight, close, intimate relationship. So much so that I know your heart and you know mine. And you lead me with your Holy Spirit. You know, we think about the Holy Spirit like he's an, a, a, the third guy in the group of Jesus and God. Like, but 
It is the Holy Spirit of God. Let's not treat him as if he's some crazy weird dude, the the funky uncle. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. It's because of him that we are saved. It's because of him that we have right standing with God. Please get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You know, when I lay my life down to live holy, it's it's not by my holiness that I am saved. Right? It's not by it's 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 not by the great choices that I make that salvation has been given to me. It's because of Jesus, and everything is because of what Jesus has done. So then, how do we respond? I love this passage because it talks about this is our this is our worship. This is this is our offering. You know, I think about this in terms of Jesus was the was the the sacrifice and the offering for salvation and 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 putting us in right standing with God. Right. So those who believe on Jesus now have the right to become sons and daughters. When you believe, when you choose this, you now are adopted into the family. And I think about that picture of family and and my little children. You know, they. There's nothing that they could do that, that would question that they are my children. Like, they could say whatever they want. They could walk away from me. But they're still always going to be my children. We just might not be in fellowship or connection together. But what I love about this picture of family is sometimes my kiddos will come up to me, and they'll bring me an offering. And that offering would come in the form of like a picture. Daddy, look, I drew this for you. Daddy, listen, I made this song. Watch me dance, Daddy. And it's so sweet. It's so sweet. I didn't ask for it. I, I didn't. I, I love them regardless. It's un, that's, that part's unconditional. But they come to me because they love me, and they say, "Daddy, look here. I brought you something. I, here's a cupcake that I made. Here, Dad. It's this. I'm offering this to you, Dad." Because I'm showing you a picture of my heart. I'm. I'm. I'm connecting my heart in my hand to you. See, God, by his sacrifice, he connected his heart to us. Now we have to respond and allow our hearts to be connected back to him. How do you respond to such mercy and such grace? You live your life in a way that brings glory to God. Sacrificially, in service to him. That's what I want to talk about today is service. We'll get there. Promise. I broke this down into three quick sections about serving because the title of today's sermon is Thank You for Your Service. Number one, where do you serve? Where? We're doing where, how, where, what, and what, where, and how. Excuse me. We already covered what. Where do I serve? I serve, in the God, I serve God and I serve in His kingdom. The kingdom of God is ever expanding. And when I give my life to Christ, boom. Welcome. You have, I, have, I, have, I have citizenship in heaven now. I'm a dual citizen. I'm an ambassador right now. I'm a citizen of heaven, and I'm an ambassador here on this earth for the kingdom of God, so that wherever I go, I represent and I carry heaven with me. Right? So as I go about my business, my daily business, whether it's in my family, whether it's in my job, wherever it may be, as I'm going about my business, I'm carrying his kingdom with me, and I'm serving his kingdom where I am. I know this is something that we have heard, that we talk about this church, this is our culture. But I want to remind you today, again, we're going back to the first love. Let's go back to that place. I want to remind you today about this. When I choose to give my life to God, I am choosing in this contract that we have written, that is signed in the blood of Jesus, to serve and give my life to him. I am now part of this country, this citizenship, this kingdom of God. So I serve him. So how do I serve him? How do, I ser- how do you serve God? I worship him and I sing songs to him. Well, okay, that's an aspect, but how do I serve God? You know, Jesus gave, gives this parable about when people serve God, and, uh, and it's, it, it stunned those who were asking and talking about it. He said, I was in prison, and I was hungry, and I was thirsty, and I was naked, and I was all these things. I'm like, wait, wait, wait what? what are you talking about, Jesus? You, like, you've been with us the whole time. When have you ever been like that? When you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. It's so easy to forget that picture sometimes. 
We get focused on ourselves and God, I need you to help me and I, I, need, you to, I need you to change my life and I've got so much garbage in here that I need you to, to transform and to take care of. And, and he does those things. By his Holy Spirit, he does those things. But it's easy for us, if we're not careful, to shift our focus back to us in that. Instead of maintaining a, a posture and a perspective that is Jesus-focused, Christ-focused. Because when it's Christ-focused, that means it's focused on someone else. He's always focused on someone else. He came here on this earth not focused on himself. Think about that for a second. If Jesus is this amazing picture of service, and he's here and he's serving, who was he serving for? It wasn't himself. It was for his father. Everything that you see me do, everything that you hear me do, everything that you hear me say, it's not me, it's for my father. I only do what he tells me. I'm not doing this on my own will, on my own accord. Even right before he dies, he says, God, please, father, please, I don't want to do this. Daniel tells me that a lot. I don't I want to. I don't want to. I'm waiting for him to say, nevertheless, Father. <laughs> Not my will, but yours be done. At that moment, I will say, okay, I'll do it, buddy. It's all right. I got it. <laughs> I would just love that so much. No, but Jesus says, not, not my, it's, not, it's not about me. I need my two by four. Yeah. It's not about me. Not my will. Father, it's your will be done. So where do we get to serve? We serve in the kingdom of God. We serve God. And we do it by living a life in service to people. That's why I, I love our, <laughs> our tagline of love God, love people. You know, there's nothing in there that says serve God, serve people. It's because service is encompassed in love. It doesn't have to be said. There, there's nothing in it that says go and evangelize. That's encompassed in love. When I'm in love with somebody, I tell everybody about them. I'm sure y'all have seen Instagram posts, Facebook posts. Oh my gosh, have you seen my child? She's so beautiful. You tell the world about the people that you love. Because you're excited about it. There's a passion there. You return to your first love. So love God, love people. I, 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 the world's got to know. And they're going to know because of the way that I treat them. The way that I talk with them. The way that I, I serve them. And I serve my God by serving my brother. By serving at my job. By serving in my community. By serving in my church. By serving my neighbor. By serving my mother. By serving my father. That's how I love Jesus, and that's how I serve him, is by doing it to those around me. So thank you for loving Jesus by serving me, church. Thank you. It's amazing. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the how, and how sometimes as we're doing this, because I would venture to say that 90% of the people who are in this room know about service to God, know about serving other people. This is not new information for, for probably the majority of people sitting in this room. Maybe for somebody watching, it might be for someone in here. But for the majority of you, you probably have heard or have been taught to grow up and, and serve God. And you serve God by serving people. But one of the things that I want to talk about today is how it can, how, I, I grew up in church. I grew up in a Christian home. These are the things that I was taught. And sometimes when you're taught these things from a young age, as you get older, as you've been doing them over and 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 over again, you can lose sight of the heart. And you can lose the first love. And so that's what, that, that's what this is about this morning. So I want to talk about a few things um, that can cause that and what we can be on guard against for that so that we can shine brightly as the body of Christ in our community and in our lives. Number one, doing the right things for the wrong reasons. I heard a quote one time, and I thought this was really good. It's, doing good for selfish reasons doesn't make you good. It just makes you good at being selfish. <laughs> I know when I, was a, when I was young, you know, I was taught, I was one of those kids that um, I could tell you every, every book of the Bible uh, just about every story of the Bible. I was well educated, uh, and 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 that education led me to to being a little cocky. My family laughs. <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens. 
Um, and the Lord's had to humble me because just because you know something does not mean you represent Father. And, and, and that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a big revelation right there. And I could tell you all about it, but until you encounter it, it's like, gee, you get knocked on your keister a few times and you learn a lesson. But I could, I could quote scripture, spout off the right answers to most questions, uh, but doing it in, in, in the wrong kind of a way, uh, with the wrong kind of an attitude, uh, a selfish attitude or, or a proud attitude that makes it look like I'm awesome, or I'm so smart, or I know better than you, or you dumb, dumb, what are you thinking? Um, that kind of an attitude is, 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 is exactly what got Lucifer kicked out. And, and God resists the proud. And so I, I never want to be a person that's proud uh, because of the things that I know. I want to make sure that, that we, we clothe ourselves in humility and in Christ. And, and this is one aspect and area in service that, that, that we can get this kind of an attitude of, I'm doing the right thing. Look at me serving. I'm doing this. God, I'm doing this for you because you told me to. Or, or, or let me help you so that you think that I'm a good person. Because people do that. I've done that. I mean, I, I'm very guilty of doing that. Um, I want to I wanna help people so, so that they think that I'm a good person. That's the wrong attitude. It's the wrong heart. And, and you know that man looks on the outside and they see that and they think, oh, wow, what an awesome person they are. They serve in their church. And they got a thousand hours of community service in their church. What amazing person they must be. Yet God examines the heart. Son, what's your motivation? What's the heart behind this? Are you doing this for you or are you doing this for me? There are many times we also do things just simply out of obedience and obligation instead of because we're thankful for what we've been given. I've been given much, therefore I give, right? I'm thankful for that. But there's so many times where it's like, I just, well, I'm, I'm doing this because I know it's the right thing to do. And you know what? There is still blessing in that too. There's still blessing in obedience. There's just better when you have a good attitude and a good heart about it. In fact, God actually, there are only like seven things in the Bible that it says God loves, and one of them is a cheerful giver. Not a begrudging, obedient. He'll receive it, but he loves a cheerful one. And that's one of the keys to godly service. It's, 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 it's locked here in the heart. The key is here in the heart. The difference between something that is done begrudgingly and something that is done willingly. Think about that. Like, think about if you've ever received something from someone who gave it to you willingly versus someone who gave it to you begrudgingly. Like, my children will be obedient when I tell them, put that, give that toy back to her but dad, ah, oh, you know, and they, they put up this whole attitude thing. But then the moments where they say, here, sis, you can have this. How much better is that? What a beautiful picture of father who willingly gives his son for us. Not, oh, here we go. I got to give Jesus because the dum-dums on earth did their own thing again. Imagine, like, can you hear him saying that? No. I want to be like my father. And his body should look like him. Amen. There's a difference between a thankful attitude and obligation. Ultimately, your heart manifests through your actions. What happens a lot of times is those who are thankful in service versus those who are begrudgingly in service, the ones who are begrudgingly in service are the ones that burn out fast. Because I'm just doing this out of obligation and ultimately I'm going to get tired and I'm going to get worn out and I don't want to do this anymore. I'm out. Deuces. But the ones who do it thankfully always, always keep a proper perspective of why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's because I'm thankful for the life that I have. I might need to take some time away from time to time to remind me to regain perspective, to recenter and to refocus and to come back to my first love. But by golly, I'm doing it because ultimately my heart is for you, not for me. And that's like tasting sweet fruit versus bitter fruit. You ever had a bitter fruit? It's still fruit. It just doesn't taste as good, right? 
In fact, actually, I cut up some strawberries for Kylie to send to her lunch, and then she sent them back. And I was like, what, what's the problem with these? She said, Daddy, they're just not good. What are you talking about? They're strawberries. And I took a bite. And I'm like, no, you're right. They're not good. <laughs> they are not ripe. Fruit can look like fruit on the outside, but once you taste it, it the, you notice the difference pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. It's not even fake fruit. It's just not ripe fruit. It's bitter. In the same way, our service can be like unripe fruit. We have to watch and guard against that. We have to have the heart of a son and the hand of a servant. And what happens a lot of times is that gets flipped. We have the heart of a servant, but a hand of a son. Son doesn't, that doesn't lift a finger. He's entitled. And a servant who's always striving for approval. Instead of flipping those things around, I'm a son who knows who I am. I'm confident in that. Yet, I'm humble enough to lend my hand to serve in whatever capacity is necessary. We must be people who have the heart of a son and the hand of a servant. That's exactly who Jesus was. In learning the value of service that it's not for me, it's, it's based in love, which is not about me, myself, or I. And understanding that the value of service, this is why we, let me just, this is why, this is why we serve. Service is God's way of reaching people. It's God's way of including you in his plan to reach humanity. You can be a part of that plan or not. That's your choice. That's based on your response. But it is God's will. You know, people who are always about, wait, am I in God's will or not? It is God's will that you be a part of his plan to reach humanity. And you do that by allowing him to use you to serve people. That's how we reach people. Has, has anybody ever walked up to you and, and, and given you something or, or maybe mowed your grass or, or served you in some way? It opened the door in your life for them, didn't it? Or, or maybe you were the one that served. It, it opens the door in people's lives to reach them. You know why? Because the majority of the world does not serve. It serves only itself. So if, if the world is self-seeking, this is countercultural. The kingdom of God seeks to serve others. And in doing so, it opens the door to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just with your words, but with your actions. I want to read some scripture this morning before we're dismissed. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 7. It says this. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. I love that. Hilarious generosity. When something is hilarious, you tend to crack up and laugh and have a lot of joy about it, right? I know we use the scripture a lot in, in, in giving financially. But our giving is not just limited to our finance. Our, our giving is only limited to our life. My mom told me a long time ago, Caleb, how do you tithe off of the air that you breathe? That's a gift. When someone was coming at me about tithing, and I was confused about it, how do you tithe off of your breath? This, isn't, this, this goes beyond money. So much beyond money. This is our life. How do I tithe off of everything that I have as a gift? I'm not only going to give God 10% back. You could have my life. You gave it to me. It's yours. Giving generously, hilariously. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough for everything, every moment, in every way. If I just read that and said, let me get a show of hands here this morning. Anybody here want to have every form of grace and everything overwhelmed by God and how amazing he is? Okay. Back up. That's how it happens. By giving, let, by allowing giving to flow from your heart. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing that you do. Just as the scriptures say about the one who trusts in him, 
Because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and generous deeds will never be forgotten. This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, what's your response to the seed? Which becomes bread for our meals, only if you plant it, is even more extravagant towards you. First, he supplies every need, plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it, so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. You will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. For when we take your gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks to God. It opens the door again for people to see how good our God is when we abundantly give. The priestly ministry you are providing through your offering, remember our life is an offering, not only supplies what is lacking for God's people, it inspires an outpouring of praises and thanksgiving to God himself. Take that for just a minute and think about this in this form. You know, if we're, if we're thinking about giving and how money helps to supply the need that is necessary for that moment, what about taking your life as the need for that moment? God wants to take that life to supply the need for the body of Christ in that moment. Maybe the body of Christ needs prayer and supplication. It needs intercessors. Maybe your life is the one that's supposed to be in there in that moment. Be ready in every moment. Because you are an integral and vital part of the body of Christ. There is not one person in here that can say, I am unnecessary. Every single person is vital to the body of Christ. Let us not forget that. Let us not forget that the body is counting on the body. And not just that, the world who needs to know about the goodness of our God is counting on us to get our stuff together. It inspires an outpouring of praises and thanksgiving to to God himself. For as your extremely generous offering meets the approval of those in Jerusalem, it will cause them to give glory to God, not to you, to God all because of your loyal support and allegiance to the gospel of Christ. I love that. It's, it's, it's not your allegiance to this church. To, 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 it's your allegiance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what bonds us and keeps us together. I just love that. I'm sorry, that's a side note. As well as your generous-hearted partnership with them toward those in need. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly wrap this up for us. Uh, and, and these are three things that are going to help us to remember or to, to, to maintain the proper kind of perspective. Number one, remember the sacrifice. Remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Whenever I get to a place where I'm feeling it's, it's obligatory to serve, I'm feeling run down, I'm feeling weary, whatever it may be, remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Hebrews tells us to run the race, cast off the weight, Leave everything else behind and remember Jesus. Remember what he did. He dropped, he, it was his drops of blood, not yours. It was, he did the bleeding. He did the dying. And when I have trouble remembering, remember him. Remember the cross. Remember the sacrifice. This will help me to put things in a better perspective when I'm feeling all whiny and tired about how I can't serve, how I can't get up to go to the men's work breakfast or the work meeting because I got so much stuff going on. How I can't go and serve at the soup kitchen because I'm just so tired, because I'm so busy. Remember the the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad he didn't say, oh, I'm just too tired to die on the cross today. I just, I'm not feeling it. It's not in my schedule. He didn't do that. And neither should we. We don't make excuses. That's not who we are. We do hard things. We do hard things. Because we're trying to give glory to our God who did the hardest thing. He laid his life down for us. So let us not forget that. Ever. Ever. Let us maintain proper perspective. Paul writes, point number two, Paul writes, do not grow weary in well-doing. Do not grow weary. In fact, I actually want to read that. It's in Galatians 6, 9. It says, and don't allow yourselves to be weary in planting good seeds for the season of reaping and the the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to others, especially to our brothers and sisters in the family of faith. Don't grow weary. In due season, you'll reap the harvest. Don't grow weary. Even though you might not see the results right now, don't grow weary. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Don't grow weary. Keep going. You will see the faithfulness of our God. Look, I don't know. You might be facing something challenging today. I just want to encourage you this morning. 
Don't grow weary. Keep going. It's 2021. Run, you're not done. Keep going. I know it might be hard. I know it may look impossible, but we serve a God of the impossible. Nothing can stop him. Keep your faith in him. Remember his sacrifice. Do not forget. You are not too far gone. Maybe you're listening today and you feel like I'm a lowly, worthless nothing. You're not. Jesus died for you. He loves you. Don't grow weary in well-doing. And finally, number three, guard against pleasing others. In our, in, our, in our line of service, in our line of work, in what we do as Christians, as believers serving, it can be easy to get your perspective off of Christ and on to pleasing others. Either because I want their approval, I'm just, af- I'm just afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Guard against pleasing others. I want to give you a great example of this in Scripture. We're not going to read it, but you're probably familiar with it. There's a guy named Barabbas and a guy named Jesus. And Pilate, instead of just making a decision himself, goes to the people and he says, what do you guys want? I'm the leader, but what do you all want? And he washes his hands of the whole situation because he doesn't want to make a decision, even though he knows what is right. He knows who the innocent person is. He pleased people. I don't want unrest in my city. I'm afraid of what might happen if I upset the apple cart. I'm afraid of what might happen if I make this decision. People might not like this. You know, this is something that it's for leadership. We face this on a very regular basis. And I tell people, when you come and you join our church, you can expect three things from me. You can expect me, for me to, to love you, always. You can expect for me to lead you. And you can expect for me to let you down at some point. Because I'm going to make a decision that you don't like. And that's okay. Relationships not on the table. We don't just walk away from people because we disagree with something that they have done in a moment. Because maybe we don't have all of the information. And or maybe I made a bad decision. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not, it's not above me to say that. I want to walk humbly with my God, but I tell you, as we walk and we live our lives, if we live it in fear of of what other people think about us, then we put ourselves in bondage. You know, we talk about being free and there's freedom and liberty in Christ Jesus, but if we keep putting ourselves back in bondage, that's our own doing. Stop living a life to please other people. Stop being so worried about what others are going to think. Be Jesus. Be love. Be Christ. Make your decisions on him and him alone. Paul even writes this, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, Galatians chapter 1. For am I now seeking the approval of man or the approval of God? Or am I trying to please man? And if I were still trying to please man, then I would not be a servant of God. So here's how you can tell who you're a servant of. <laughs> If you're trying to please man, you're not a servant of God. You're a servant of man. And you become a slave to man. Paul writes, I'm a bond servant. I'm a slave to God. I'm a slave to Christ. When I lay down my life and I say, I'm serving you and you alone, I am a slave to Christ. I've given you my life. Whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. But when I begin to please and chase after pleasing man, I am no longer a slave to Christ. I'm a slave to man. And that is not who we are called to be. So let us not be that. Let us be on guard against our emotions, our feelings, our mentality. we got to renew our mind daily. We have to regain perspective on who do I serve. Apostle Bob, the one of the very first gifts that he ever gave me is this little knit uh, piece of artwork that says, remember who you serve. I serve God, not people. And as a leader of a church, it can be easy to, to get that focus shifted on people because we serve God by serving people. But if, I, if, I, if you miss the, the, the centerpiece of it all being Jesus and you start only trying to meet people's needs instead of doing what he has told you to do, then now you've become a slave to people. And that's not who we are. And that's not what this body is about. That's not what the body of Christ is. There's only one head in this body, and that's Jesus. Amen. So, your loving service, emphasis on loving service, demonstrates the heart of our God. 
And it opens the door to talk about him. Now I want to I finish right here. When you serve and you do it in a loving way, and you do it in a way that brings honor to Christ, what it does is it serves a purpose, good works in our community to those around us. It gets something done, but then it also has an eternal purpose and that it opens the door for you now to begin to share and witness your faith to someone. Why do you do, you're different than everybody else. Why are you helping out? Why are you doing this? Well, because my God laid his life down for me and he freely gave it to me. So I, it's, I said, God, this is your life to give. I, I, I'm serving you. My life is not my own. I'm not trying to take that thing back up. <laughs> I, I'm not doing that. But I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to lay it down for you, Jesus, and I'm going to lay it down for those around me. And if that means that I have to sacrifice my time, sacrifice my money, <laughs> my money, sacrifice my skills, then so be it. Here's the altar. Because Jesus, you're the only thing that I care about. You're the only one that I love. You are my heart. And in that, so are your people. So be encouraged today. Stand with me this morning. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. With other houses, too. I love you guys so much. I, I, you know, I, I just, I hope that my heart, we're getting ready to embark on a journey here in the next several weeks about the vision of this church and where we're going. And, and I ultimately, it can all be boiled down to, I, I just hope and pray that the reputation of Restoration Christian Church in this community and beyond is one that is Jesus only. It's only about Jesus. It's not about what we do, the methods that we do things. It's about those people love God, man. They're on fire for Jesus. And they're incredibly loving and compassionate people. I want to be a part of something like that. I want to be a part of something like that. But that requires a lot from us. We have to be people who do and not just talk about it. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord. We just we we come to you in thanksgiving this morning. We are incredibly thankful for your sacrifice, Jesus, for giving your life for us so that we can be free, so that we can receive your abundant life, your healing, your prosperity, your blessing. We can receive all these things that you make available to us. We're so thankful for that. And Lord, we repent and we turn from looking at other things, putting our, our, our perspective on ourselves, our jobs, our children, whatever it may be that have distracted us from being in service to you. We repent for being lazy, for being apathetic. We repent for being afraid. We receive your love today to drive out any and all fear. The fear of man, the fear of failure, the fear of shame and guilt and condemnation. Those things have to go today in Jesus' name. We are not buying into or putting our faith with those things. But we are returning to our first love. We are saying yes to you. We are renewing our vows to you today. I do. I do. Lord, I pray for anyone in here who is dealing with any kind of sickness or illness. You sent your word and it healed them. So by your stripes, they're healed. We declare that in the name of Jesus right now. I pray over anyone this morning who is dealing with any kind of uh, emotional trauma or mental trauma or sickness that was covered on the cross as well. I speak peace over their heart and mind in the name of Jesus right now. We release your angels to minister life, strength, health, and wholeness right now in Jesus' name. We put on the full armor of God to protect us, to protect our mind, to protect our heart, to protect our body, the body of this church in Jesus' name. And we speak out against the things of the air, the things in the atmosphere right now that are warring. We loose the angels, the host of angels to war on our behalf. We rest in you, Jesus, 
and we allow your angels to fight for us. We allow you to fight for us. You go before us. You prepare a way. You are our strong tower. You are our rock. So on you we rest and we have refuge. So if there are things right now going on in your life that you're battling, that are, that you're, that's coming against you right now, you got to speak to it. Open your mouth and speak to it. you got to open your mouth and speak to it. It cannot stand. It cannot stay in the name of Jesus. We speak and release peace everywhere that we go. Father, I pray that if there's anyone in here this morning, if there's anyone who's listening online, if there's anyone who will watch this later, and they're here today and they've never given their life to you, they've never submitted themselves to you, they, they didn't even know they could become a part of this family. Holy Spirit, that you're working on their heart right now. I want to tell you today, it's the easiest thing that you can do. It's also one of the hardest things you can do. It's the best decision you could ever make, saying yes to Jesus and putting your faith in him. But it's going to be a daily thing. I'm not going to be a sleazy salesman and say all things are going to be peachy because you might walk through some stuff. But the good news is that you have a hope as you walk through it. You have a protector as you walk through it. You have a God who loves and cares for you so much that he would give his son to die for you. Jesus came to die for you so that you could receive life and health and peace. He is the Prince of Peace. You can receive that today by putting your faith in him, saying, I believe, Jesus, that you are God. I believe it, and I confess it here in my heart, with my mouth before man. I confess Jesus is Lord. He is God. Come in and change my life. Maybe you've given your life to Christ, but you've been doing your own thing. Now's your moment to respond. Now's your moment Say, God, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm turning away from it. My choices I've sown to destruction, to my flesh. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I want to sow to the Spirit. I want to come back to my first love. I've forgotten it, but I'm coming back. I believe I have a word for you today. Father says, come on. Come on. I'm here. I'm ready for the hug. Let's go. He loves you. He's not guilting you. He wants to transform your life. Run to him. (laughs) He's so good. He's so good. God, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you're doing in this house of miracles. I thank you that it doesn't just take place here. But as we go out to eat lunch as we go out to go shopping, as we go out to hang out with our family and go back to work, that we carry miracles with us wherever we go. That it's undeniable. Your presence in our life is undeniable. That our attitude is loving and humble, but bold and courageous. In Jesus' name, amen.